Now, Roger Kennedy is uh, five or six different people in one person, and uh, he makes them cohere better than <laughs> most of us can. He has been extremely important to the Long Now Foundation. Uh, he came in, got immediately what we were up to, and led us uh, pretty quickly to the mountain in eastern Nevada where we aimed to build a 10,000 year clock. And one of the reasons he was so knowledgeable about that particular mountain is because it was at that time Great Basin National Park was the most recent and smallest national park in the system and it needed uh, some attention. And he, having been the director of the National Park Service in the 90s, was very well aware of this hidden secret, the only national park in Nevada and we're now privileged to be part of that, uh, thanks to him. Over to you, Roger. The uh, Old Testament lesson is from Ezekiel 34, 18 through 19. But I don't want to die there yet. Seemeth it a small thing unto you to have eaten up the good pasture, but ye must tread down with your feet the residue of your pastures, and to have drunk of the deep, clear waters, but you must foul the residue with your feet. And as for my flock, they eat that which you have trodden with your feet, and they drink that which you have fouled with your feet. And the more modern text is from Jonathan Edwards. Not the Jonathan Edwards that is most familiar to us. And this text may not be one that you have all memorized. And it goes like this. The fields and woods seem to rejoice, and how joyful do the birds seem to be in it. How much a resemblance is there of every grace in the fields covered with plants and flowers. And each sort of rays play a distinct tune to the soul, besides those lovely mixtures that are found in nature. Those beauties, how lovely in the green of the face of the earth, in all manner of colors of flowers the color of the sky and the lovely tinctures of the morning and the evening. That is God's earth, our earth. I commence with uh, an homage to Stuart Brand, of course. Uh, this isn't the whole earth to be cataloged, but it is a portion of it. It's invocative because it indicates to us that from the very beginning, before humans arrived, there was a place here. 50,000 odd years ago, people made it to Australia and about at the same time, they commenced their wandering in our direction. For some reason un understood by me, it's assumed that the people who did not walk to Australia had to walk to North America, which makes very little sense to me. Recent discoveries in the Channel Islands suggest that they didn't necessarily have to walk here either. But by 9000 BC, their migrations had led them to settle into a number of places where the Clovis points were far more, far more, a hundred times more frequent in the south and the east of the United States than in the south and the west. Those first artifacts that we can clearly a tribute to human presence, settled into three places. And I'm just going to ask you to keep, kind of keep these places in mind. There's the bend of the Tennessee River. There's the intersection of the Ohio, the Mississippi, and the Missouri, a place of intense importance. And I just want you to remember that by 9,000 BC, people had gone there on purpose. I'm coming back over this country in just a moment. But at the peak of civilization in North America before the arrival of the newcomers, there were very dense settlements in the same center of the country at the Ohio, Missouri, and Mississippi Center. More people present in that intersection than in Rome or London at the time. Once again, in the, in the inter, at the elbow of the Tennessee and just below it, and along the Savannah River. 
These were densely settled places. I'm just going to anticipate the rest of this talk for those of you who snooze. Because by the time that Europeans arrived, the behavior of our predecessors in this continent had been such that in those three, three places, there was no sites, meaning no architectural evidence of human presence in the center of the nation, where there had been the heaviest density. Oh, you'd like me to do that, Stuart. I'd be delighted to do so. Nobody. It was called, it's, archaeologists have been prone lately to call it the vacant quarter. The Savannah River Basin had been similarly evacuated when the Spaniards got there with DeSoto. They called it, the Indians called it, the desert of Okute. It was wholly uninhabited. And the center of the Tennessee River and below it, which had been a great concentration of population, had similarly been evacuated. The carrying capacity of the continent had been exceeded. Now I'm going to go in sequence, now that you know the end of the story before the advent of European cattle, sheep, microbes, and persons. I want to focus our attention at the very outset of the evidence of human presence, the evidence that is in architecture. Before the steppe pyramids at Sakahara in Egypt, Watson Brake was created in the, in the Mississippi Delta. This is the first major piece of American architecture. It's now under a lot of second growth, but there it is, about a football field wide. We have no idea who was there, what languages they spoke. There is no evidence of any human bodily evidence. It's all gone. We have nothing to, about their DNA or anything else, except that they chose to gather together for this purpose about 4,000 BC. They used, however, as all humans apparently do, they had a propensity for making art. They made little glazed gray-white cubes that was their art. Later, 1,500 years later, at Poverty Point in Louisiana, things got serious. That is three football fields long. That is at Avenue directly north and south by the, uh, by the stars. It parallels another exact one, which passes through an effigy mound of, of immense size, which is still there in the shape of a falcon. There's another falcon down this way, and each of these concentric circles, if you sort of add up that much dirt, it's seven miles of this. This is an enormous site, about the time of Troy 7b, Priam. Uh, is it Brad Pitt? I can never remember. Whichever one it was. <laughs> That's who this is. They made objects and used them for ceremonial purposes, which required them, as all artists must, to go to great lengths to get them. This material comes from, this is a steatite, which comes from Arkansas and Missouri, but they went as far as North Carolina for beautiful stone to carve. This is a little owl. They made owls and they made foxes. And when the last proprietor of the Louisiana State Park that keeps track of Poverty Point died, after 20 years of presence. His partner told me that for four successive nights, a fox circled the works each night, precisely at midnight, and went away. Our European forefathers encountered architecture not so early as that first. The biggest pieces of architecture that George Washington ever saw, or for that matter, the biggest pieces of architecture that Americans who did not go to Europe and those who did go to Europe saw were in the Ohio River Valley. This happens to be at Marietta, where the Mariettans, Washington's uh, officer corps that settled out there, were at great pains to preserve it. They thought it must have been Roman. Washington camped at the base of Grave Creek which is still there in West Virginia. These are immense structures, far bigger, far bigger than anything in, uh, created in Europe at the time. They were components of an, an immense and important 
settled system of persons who had migrated into these areas and were related to each other. Their works of art were composed of material brought from the Gulf and from the Gulf of California, from the copper from up in the northern peninsula of Michigan and Isle Royal. They were related to each other intimately, culturally, and we have no idea what languages they spoke or who they were genetically. But we do know that they had a deep sense of technology and architecture. Archaeology tells us that they knew astronomy. These structures, the one on the north, on the far up there, is at Newark, that's an octagon, that's a circle. It's precisely at right angles to another octagon and circle here. And I want to call your attention particularly to this little circle up here and this one down here. Because this is what trained our forefathers to pay respect to the uses of land by their predecessors. This is how they learned because of the intensity of their direct experience to pay attention to the possibility that you can abuse the land and cease to be able to su support a civilization. How big were these places? Well, this is the little Newark circle that you saw there. That's a golf course, of course. We take care of golf courses. So we have this one left. That's just the circle. You can see the hyphen that goes to the octagon off that way. This is just to give you some sense of scale. These are very large. This is what Thomas Jefferson first knew of that set of systems created by another kind of person. This is a model of Circleville, Ohio, that little circle there, and its adjacent squares. My attention was drawn back to this material about a month and a half ago because my pal Hedrick Smith did a television program about Walmart's acquiring uh, from abroad its primary sources and closing down a plant in Circleville. This is Circleville in 1836. Do you remember what that circle looked like, Will? There's what's left of the circle. But the interesting thing about the citizens of Circleville is that they created an octagonal town hall. They didn't pay attention to what it, their predecessors had done for very long, however. That's 1837. That's 1838. That's 1849. And that's 1856. The obliteration of the, of the preceding circumstance and its replacement with something else is characteristic of the advent of certain kinds of views of the land. We supervene it. This, of course, is the floor of the Pantheon, in the center of which the man-god emperor sits under the simulated dome of heaven and presides over the gridding of the imperial earth. That, of course, is the Northwest Ordinance. It's the same process and pattern. We shall overcome, but in a different way. However, one of the characteristics absent from our generations and present to the founding fathers was a deep sense that they were interpenetrating in their lives with preceding lives, lived on the edge of what was possible in a continent. Now, what you're looking at are a set of nice architectural drawings. This is the conventional Palladian model. Thomas Jefferson's uh, characteristic training was in this. You have a central house, you have a couple of pavilions, they're linked together by hyphen. Lots of bigger ones, smaller ones. This happens to be, however, Jefferson's version, and it's not Monticello, it's Poplar Forest. That's an octagonal house at the center, and on the wing, that's the octagonal house in the center. There's an octagonal dining room, an octagonal set of tables. We pay attention to octagons and circles, as you saw from the preceding one, but we do it in a way that the Europeans never did. That's the flanker. It's not a little building. It's a mound. There's the hyphen. But it wasn't, and the entire estate plan is that of Circleville, Ohio. These mounds are Jefferson's deference to the world that preceded him. Jefferson wasn't alone in that. That, this is my magnificent photograph of, that's Mount Vernon back there. See, that's Mount, that's Mount Vernon back there. But 
I'll bet you don't see every time you visit George Washington's deference to his experience with the largest architecture he ever saw, the architecture at the foot of which he had camped six times in the Ohio Valley. His deference is his mines, which flank the entrance to Monticello and between which he looked to the west. Washington's sense of, having, of inhabiting a continent in which there had been predecessors was, however, nothing to that of his colleagues and subordinates. This is what George Rogers Clark and both Lewis and Clark knew of American antiquity as they encountered it first. This is Monk's Mound at Cahokia, Illinois, just across from St. Louis, at the foot of which Lewis and Clark camped. Isn't it any of those wonderful Lewis and Clark television shows? Why? Because we don't pay any attention to the continent upon which they came. It's part of the pantheonic instinct. We did it. There was nobody there before. Well, there was. This is bigger in footprint than any of the pyramids in Egypt. It's very big. That's it in reconstruction. This is Cahokia at the time in the 12th century, 13th, in which it was bigger than Rome or London by population standards and by architecturally infinitely more interesting. Not as elaborate as that, surely, but Teotihuacan is a part of the same family. Now, you can't encounter that kind of thing without wondering what happened to it, what happened to those people, and why. I suggested earlier that the center point of the continent, St. Louis, the Ohio, the Missouri, the Mississippi, came together at a place in which there was intense human settlement from 9,000 BC continuously to about 12 or 1300 AD. That's a long time for humans to be in a single place. At the end of that period, however, they commenced to make very intense use of the natural resources available to them. They commenced in their bickerings to require military architecture. They had a defense budget. This is the Cahokians' defense budget. Maybe as much as 80 or 90 miles of this got built by them out of what there was left over when they had used the rest of it to heat and cook by. And when, in the words of Ezekiel, they had fouled the earth. By 100 years after they began building, this is a simulation, of course, structures of this kind, there was nobody there. The terrain had been wholly, wholly evacuated. This is the part that Lewis and Clark didn't see. They didn't camp at the base of this. This is just across the river. This is St. Louis in the 13th century. Oh, I could have shown you Pittsburgh in the 13th century or Cincinnati in the 13th century. Anthony Wayne put his sharpshooters on the top of this kind of architecture in Cincinnati. Nashville, there isn't a major interesting Midwestern city that wasn't a city once before. This happens to be St. Louis. This is the edge of St. Louis in 1818. Let me show you what I mean by that. There's that little diddle. This is 13th century St. Louis. Let me show you the equivalent to Circleville. This is St. Louis a little bit later with a little bit bigger. There we go. There we go. This is St. Louis just a little bit later in 1842. It's a little less of it. And now finally, St. Louis. It's a warehouse district. This is Mound Avenue. <laughs> well, the point I was trying to make is a simple one. There's a lot of political history that takes place in the course of arriving at the point at which population is densest and most exploitive of the natural resources available. That political history often presents itself in architectural form. Now we're going to drift away from architecture simply because we now have come to people who leave written records and who talk about themselves in ways that we can follow. We're going to talk about imperial presence 
and empire. But we're not going to do this starting out with Queen Elizabeth. We're going to start out with American empire. Don't need to do the Incas and the Aztecs, or it turns out uh, most recently the Maya. Let's just do the first set of Eastern Indians that got modern military technology, the Iroquois, who became an imperial power just on the brink of their own national extinction, essentially, and began overwhelming everybody else. The Iroquois hegemony went as far as the Mississippi. They wiped out the Indians to the east, which is why there was a last Mohican, or there was only one after them, and everybody to the north and south of them. This is a great imperial power. The presence of the expansion of the Iroquois represents the presence of, of gunpowder and guns. That's how they did it. To the west of them, the other advent of new military technology, the horse, produces enormous changes and shifts in the whole nature of the imperial system. And it's not national imperial system. It's both racial and national. We formed Afro-America in the south and the east. That's really what it is. It's where black people were in the majority. Let's leave their condition out for a moment. Let's just observe them present. The horse alters utterly the West, expanding from Santa Fe and otherwise. We get the Russian American system extending to Fort Ross, forts at Waikiki, forts on the California coast, a very active imperial power casting its eyes upon the silver mine of New Spain. New Spain, however, has another kind of evolution, very interestingly, I think, and present in our lives today. This is not Spanish America, not at all. It's a conglomerate people evolving from the presence of a whole lot of Spanish males and many, many Indian females. And we got an entirely different kind of population, very different from that evolving in British North America. You know, the United States you know all about, so there's no reason to spend any time on it. Let's do spend a little time, however, on the next set of forced movements of persons. The rest of this little talk for the next 10 minutes is going to be about migrations of people because they're not what we usually have thought them to be. For instance, this set of persons, this is the Sioux. These are woodland farming people. The Sioux are woodland farming people. They are driven out of the, their woodland habitat westward as are the Cheyenne who are deeply woodland people as their ethnology tells us. They are driven out of the woods westward by other folks speaking another set of languages that have the gun. At the same time that these people are moving back out into the Great Plains, other people are coming into the Great Plains from the north and the West, the Navajo, the Apache, the Kiowa, they come down in this direction. Now, what's out here? Nobody pays any attention, uh, it's, it's traditional American history, to the Great Plains. Why is that? Because there isn't anybody there for a very long time. After the Alta Thermal, after it gets cold and Greenland gets cold and people have to withdraw back to Scandinavia, leaving little images of bishops and other things carved in ivory. The plains appear to have been virtually as empty as the desert of Okute or the empty quarry. Back into the plains, we are now eventually learning, come a whole bunch of people who speak Algonquian languages who come out of Idaho and go east, not west as traditionally we were trained to do, but we now know a lot more about them. Now here, we're beginning to get into languages and genetic strains. We know that that set of people going all the way east and then moving backward again, having possessed themselves of firearms, are pushing everybody else back into the previously evacuated plains. North Dakota and South Dakota have turned into badlands. They were really pretty icky after the great uh, cooling, drying, drought of the 13th and 14th century, but they were free of opposition, so these people could move in. Okay, these migration patterns are going on while the political history we pay our attention to was going on between the United States and its competitors. 
You could zip right through everything that you knew all about anyway. We know that in 1803, we purchased a place, and in Article 3 of the purchase agreement, we agreed that there would be slavery in the, in the Louisiana Territory. And because the Federalists lost the debates of 1856, slavery was not stopped in Louisiana or Arkansas. It spread up into the rest of the purchase, and we got a civil war, which was not fought over the presence of slavery where it was, but was fought over whether or not it would expand into this wonderful new territory where it wasn't necessarily going to spread until political decisions were made that it would. In 1819 and 1820, we began acquiring some other things, and we picked up Texas, and we picked up um, the Mexican session of 48. I, I think if this is still in there, no, it isn't, how nice. We, we lost a wonderful image. I simply have to tell you, therefore, that you must believe me that this is true. That if you looked at the image of the Texas acquisition and the Mexican sessions, you would see that the Hispano-Indian people of the Mexican-Hispanic tradition are simply taking it back again. If you look at the counties in which those people are currently predominant and becoming predominant, they are simply taking back everything they lost after the Onis Adams Treaty of 1819-20. It's a good thing to remember that politics has certain recurrences in them. Now, now we're getting extremely contemporary. This is the last decade or so. It's actually a pretty good model of what happened in the preceding 60 years. Now, this is, this is not red states and blue states in the conventional way. This is more interesting than that by a long shot, and I suspect considerably longer in its effects and its current duration. The center of the United States is emptying out. The population is flowing uphill, out of the center, toward the mountains, and toward the Piedmont in the east. What is emerging in the center of this country, where the population density has returned in the year 2004 to that density that Frederick Jackson Turner observed in 1894, as marking the end of the frontier. It's back in Nebraska and Kansas. It's back in Iowa. It's back in North Dakota and South Dakota. We have returned the center of the nation by evacuation to the condition in which it was at that time. Population had moved out of the Great Plains again as it did after the Alta Thermal, after the 1888-89 droughts and blizzards, when more prairie schooners went east than west for two years, and the upper great upper plains emptied. We have now returned to that. So what we are getting in this great center of our nation is a white, elderly, relatively sedentary, relatively sedentary population that has a sense of, a, of longevity coupled with resentment. <laughs> it is like those persons who stay in an Irish village while others depart for the new world. This doesn't make them worse or better, but they are different. Where are they? going. Well, in the first place, they're going into danger, and I'll come to that point next. It's a point I won't amplify very much in this talk, but it's very much on my mind. They're going initially to this range of, uh, they are going to the risers, having left uh, the treads. They are going this way. They went to California, but as you know, two-fifths of the population increase in the adjacent states to California, Nevada, Arizona, and to a considerable extent, the states north of it comes from out-migration from California. The, the growth of the adjacent states does, is not out of the Midwest, it's out of California. This is the, 
This is the backflow. This is the backflow from California. Very significant psychological consequences of that, too. There is a measure of disappointment that lingers in those reverse movements. I suspect that was true among the Cheyenne and the Sioux as well. They're also going out of the center and out of Appalachia into the Piedmont, not into the mountains in this side, but into the Piedmont. Out of the six, out of the seven states into which population has moved most rapidly in the last 30 years, six are the most fire endangered states in the nation. One, two, three, four, five, six, one, three, five, six, but they're the same state. Why is that significant? Because uh, uh, the populations that are going to encounter that kind of natural hazard, as well as those who knew that they were going to encounter your kind of natural hazard, are unprepared for either. The weather's hot-er and drier already where they're going. The vegetation in precisely the places to which they have gone is most inflammable, and I urge a little more attention to this because, and to this, of course, and a bit to this, and I'm going to show you a couple of more images of this, but the primary point I wish to emphasize is that this is not just a, a dynamic system with respect to humans moving back and forth across the continent. It's a dynamic system with regard to the continent itself. The weather is not constant. It never was constant on a cyclical basis. And it certainly is not constant on a secular basis. And if you throw a little more temperature and a little more dryness at this, the world will change radically. A degree or two, and you might just look at what the underbrush looks like and the fallen stuff and tinder between Charlottesville and Chapel Hill sometime, and then you will begin to be clear enough that the problem of wildfire in this country is an urban and an eastern problem more than it's a western problem, though in both places it's urban, not country. Add a little temperature. This is the red movement into the red peril. Now, let's get a little local. It's not rural, it's urban. It's not Western, it's Eastern. And I, I, this is not an audience that has an intense interest in Connecticut or Massachusetts, but if you were, I would tell you this. 66% of Massachusetts is in what the Westerners call the urban wildland interface. It's just safe now because the climate hasn't changed much. Connecticut and Massachusetts have a higher level of occupancy in endangered places subject to a little climate change of any states in the Union. However, that's not where we are at the moment. The places into which people are moving, this is population growth, and fire danger. There's Tahoe and there's, <laughs> there's a problem. This problem we'll return to in just a minute. But I want to suggest to you that in every instance the Western fire problem is an urban one and it's getting worse both because the climate's changing and because the people are moving into it. This is the corridor between Tahoe, Santa Fe, and Albuquerque. There's where the fire problem is. This most dramatically of uh, that, no, this one. How do we get back? Is that this one? Or? No, that's not this one. That's even farther. I don't have the foggiest idea. Let's just let's just do it with our glorious imaginations. Let's not fiddle with this. <laughs> let's just do this. In the front range of Colorado, the precise correlation is between in migration down to the zip code and intense fire danger. It isn't just that the states that are most dangerous to fire 
are the states into which people are moving, it's that the zip codes in those states correlate that way. And there's a third factor of some interest to some of you, and that is that there is a precise correlation between those people who suffer from fire and poverty. This is not a rich person's problem. This is not about second houses at Tahoe. This is about trailer houses in places that are the only places you can get a place you can buy. That population, that population is exposed to the kind of dangers of losses that this country has not seen and has not anticipated. I don't need to discourse to you about seismic probabilities nor about flood probabilities, but I wouldn't feel very healthy leaving you with the implication that global climate change is a problem for Greenland. It's a problem for Atlanta. It's a problem for Chapel Hill. It's a problem for Santa Fe, for Taos, for Tahoe, for Reno, and of course, drying this place up, that is Los Angeles, is going to produce some extremely interesting consequences in a place which will burn every year anyway. Anyway. Well, <laughs> I think the only way to handle that is to get rid of it. Now, Stuart, how do I get rid of it? Because I have a couple of more things I'd like to say. Ooh, glorious. Okay. No, 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 we don't want that. Just, we don't want that. We can, we can handle this all by ourselves, can't we, together? Humans have migrated back and forth across North America, moved by a wide variety of impulses. Religious, very important impulses. The evacuation of Chaco almost certainly was the consequence of the collapse of a theocratic system. Yes, accentuated by climate change, yes, of course. Or by weather change, not climate change. The evacuation of uh, portions of England and the transfer of their populations to the United States certainly occurred for religious reasons. The collapse of the Huguenot attempts to occupy the southern side of the North American continent in the presence of the onslaught of militant, crusading, Catholic Europe brought to an end a whole set of religious principles and practices in the southern portion of, the United, of this continent, which had been there for several thousand years earlier. Religion moved people into Utah and northern Arizona and a variety of other places. We need to take quite seriously that people do not always move just for economic reasons. The market does not resolve any truly serious human choice. We don't pick our wives for that purpose. We don't love our children for that purpose. And many people don't move for that purpose either. They move because they want to be in the presence of certain qualities of living that they vaguely associate with a kind of world they aspire to inhabit. Religion, meaning the study of what you take most seriously in Reinhold Niebuhr's words, and a desire to comport yourself in harmony with the earth are related impulses, though some persons are made uncomfortable by one or the other. People moved because they had to move, because the places they had previously occupied were no longer habitable. It isn't just that the Cahokians and the St. Louisans of the 13th century had exhausted the carrying capacity of that enormously fertile region to support them by using up all the wood and certainly contaminating all the water sources. It's that discernibly their skeletal remains tell us they were becoming less and less healthy, very much like Americans of our own time isn't obesity in that case, it's too much sugar in the diet and too much dependence upon corn. We know they were becoming 
a more and more frail people even before the onset of European microbes. We know that peoples weaken themselves in circumstances in which they do not pay rapt attention to the context within which they live. This leads us to the political future. Now, I am, I am in many ways a fool, but I am not such a fool as to stand before Paul Sappho and all the GBN folks and Stuart Brand and tell you about scenarios. I, I'm not that kind of a fool. But I, um, I do have some suggestions as to what I think might conceivably occur primarily because in deference to uh, uh, other and wiser heads that will be before you shortly, I looked at an absolutely silly review of Brother Diamond's new book in the New York Times in which the, I fear, sometimes said to be California uh, propensity for techno-fix foolishness reached a level of absurdity previously unknown to me. Let us not, says the writer, worry, let us not worry about all the things that the founders worried about as they considered the presence and absence of people who were no longer there, but who had wrought wonders where they were. Let us not worry, says the writer, about our own propensity to violate all of the biblical, all of the biblical teachings about fouling the earth. For, and here is one of two outcomes to which I want to suggest a third. One is the apocalyptic techno fix. What might human society be like 13,000 years from now? Above us in the Milky Way are essentially infinite resources and living space. If the face of fossil-driven technology leads to discoveries that allow homo sapiens to move into the galaxy, goodbye, mom, then resources, population pressure, and other issues that worry diamond will be forgotten. Most of the Earth may be returned to primordial stillness, and the whole thing would have happened in the blink of an eye by nature's standards. That consoling thought we have so fouled our nest that we can leave it one more time confirms the pattern of behavior of us humans over this long story at our very worst. More scary than that to me is apocalyptic resignation. Now prevalent in some groups who prefer to have the apocalypse soon <laughs> and who treat the probabilities of the deaths of hundreds of millions with an equanimity which is staggering to those who call themselves in the name of Christ. The notion that we should be so indifferent to the probable death and destruction of countless, of not just our species, but other species, is an abomination in the eyes of any of the major religions of our time, any serious person. And so abominable, as it seems to me, to require a response, not to require simple indignation. I think there's a third way to respond to the continuing impulses that have been present among humans so long as humans have left us any evidence on the ground or in books to tell us of those impulses. And that is the capability of humans to reform. The political history of this country is sequential but it's not linear. The early period of our national life 
was marked not just by a revolution, but by the freeing of the slaves in half the states of the Union. That's not a trivial achievement. It occurred very early. People of their own time freed the slaves in half the states of the Union. They did it for moral reasons that were very explicit, led by the Quakers, but not by the Quakers alone. It's almost always forgotten by people who think that values-based conversation is embarrassing, that it's sometimes effective. The second great instance in our national history, after, let's take it in sequence. First half, the, the first period, the first decade or so, we did pretty well. We declared independence, and we got rid of slavery in most of the states. Then we had the first Jim Crow at the end of the 1790s. It was sort of normalcy pre-visited. We got resegregation. Women lost the vote where they had it, which was in New Jersey and in New York. Blacks were deprived of the vote so that by 1820, a rather heavily black voting population no longer could vote. It's important to know that Aaron Burr and Alexander Hamilton vied for the votes of free blacks in New York who voted a lot. In the 1830s and 40s, we did some things that were perhaps even more remarkable. Those of you who have lived in a family that had an alcoholic in it can recognize the enormous achievement of that period, almost totally unrecognized by people who take a despairing view of our national politics. We got rid of national alcoholism, not with legislation, but we cut average male alcohol use by 60%. Most American upper class males went to bed drunk in 1800 and less than 15 to 20% went to bed drunk in 1840. There is only one decent book about this. It's called The Alcoholic Republic. It's a very good book. Its point is that when we get our minds to things because we are affronted by their adverse circumstances in 1840 or in 2005, we can move ourselves to do something about it. This was an addicted nation in 1810. It was a less addicted nation by 1840. That was also the period in which women began to be noticed and required noticing. Again, let's remember they had voted once. Oh, I do have to tell you this one pleasant little story. My old friend Aaron Burr and Albert Gallatin proposed to Thomas Jefferson that women be given primary posts <coughs> in the Jefferson administration of 1800. And Jefferson responded to them, that is a proposition for which the public is not prepared, nor am I. But a hundred years later, the public was prepared for it. And look, taking a long view, we can reform ourselves in many ways, even in the way we look at half of our population. The 1860s, after all, was a period in which we summoned ourselves at immense cost in blood and treasure to abolish slavery in a war ultimately fought, ultimately fought for that purpose. It had been fought initially to prevent the expansion of slavery, remedying previous political errors and losses of nerve. But in the 1860s, we did it. In the 70s, we lapsed. In the 80s, we began to get our nerve back again. In the progressive era, we began to get our nerve back even more strongly. We lapsed in the 1920s. We got our nerve back in the, 18, in the 1930s and 40s. 50s, mixed. 60s and 70s, back comes the energy. I firmly believe that we would have entered a period of the same if it had not been for 9-11. I firmly believe that the undergirding in this country is there for a recovery of nerve, of a recovery of purpose, and of a commitment to fundamental 
American values. I believe that for that to happen, a wave of reform and reassertion is required. I can't offer you scenarios, but I believe in my core that this country is bent upon a course which is remediable and will be remedied, and we will begin to look again at the world we inhabit seriously and responsibly. That's the best I can do for prognosis, but I do want to suggest that we have some guides toward it. Those are going to be found, I think, in some texts that we could well rediscover. But in order to do that, the sense of a text has to be expanded just a little, I think. I suspect Spencer Beebe is going to help in that a little because he reads from nature directly. But there are some American texts of considerable longevity among European Americans that can help us toward that. I read to you earlier some of Jonathan Edwards' sermon about the woods and the fields, which seemed to rejoice in joy. He sang his sermons of rejoicing in nature. He sang them in nature, and he sang them to his congregation. We have come to think of ourselves as being so committed to a theology of dominance that we haven't looked at the theology of dominance and in its origins. The talk about dominance so frequently cited by those who think we are bent upon a course of extinction of all other species comes from the first two chapters of Genesis in which dominance is a description of the role of Adam and Eve before they broke the covenant. When Adam and Eve transgressed their limits, when Adam and Eve decided to break through the membrane within which they were held to their obligations and limits, they lost their dominance. There isn't a word in the Old Testament confirming that sense of humans as the dominant species after the third chapter of Genesis, after the loss of dominance comes the law. After you transgress your limits comes the Endangered Species Act. After you lose and break your covenant, you require some kind of order. The sense of wonder, I think, is the fundamental principle upon which the next revolt and reform will come. The wonder in the transmission and expression of the creator's interest in the earth in everything about us. That sense of wonder is an essential part of the tradition in Islam, in the Eastern religions, and in that kind of Christian tradition which was disrupted in the Enlightenment, but which is still very present in just a couple of very familiar verses with which I would like to close. Edward's emphasis was upon our common habitation of an earth populated by other species with whom we are partners and components of the very nature of God himself. 
Francis of Assisi is the familiar one, not our more recent American one. But you all know this, you could probably sing it a cappella. Praised be my Lord God for all creatures and especially our brother the sun, which brings us the day and the light. Fair is he and shining with very great splendor. O Lord, he signifies you us, you to us. Praised be my Lord for our sister the moon and for the stars, which God has set clear and lovely in heaven. Praised be my Lord for our brother the wind and for air and cloud and calms and all weather in which you uphold in life all creatures. Blessed be my Lord for our sister water, which is very serviceable to us and humble and precious and clean. Praised be our Lord for brother fire, through which you give us light in the darkness and he is bright and pleasant and very mighty and strong. Praised be my Lord for our sister the earth, which sustains us and keeps us and yields diverse fruits and flowers of many colors and grass. Jonathan Edwards loved the color of nature, the color of the place we are. And just before he died, he said that the reason why most persons, almost all men and women, and those that seem to be most miserable, love life, is because they cannot bear to lose the sight of such a beautiful and lovely world. That is our natural habitat. That is the world we have sometimes abused. That is the world we can recover once we take our role in this world as seriously as did our predecessors. Thank you. Thank you, Roger. Uh, can we bring the lights up just a little bit, especially the spotlights up here so uh, we get more light on the stage? Okay, here's a question from Kevin Kelly. Uh, we noticed the absence of California in any of your maps of ancient metropolises, and uh, we got some now. What, what's, uh, what happened? All we know really is that in the, during the Ice Age, there was a refugia in which humans accumulated, learning various languages, more languages than any other set of humans in North America, um, in California and north of it. What we also know is that there was a propensity to build big in those portions of North America in which there was no easy living. Those were harder places to live in than other places. The Pacific Northwest was easy living, so was South Florida, and people didn't build big, they lived in big. It was there. Why bother? I think. Do you think there was a sequence, this is my question now following on that in a way, uh, what we're seeing now is the countryside is emptying out, not just the Buffalo Commons and the High Plains, but basically villages are emptying out, except the ones that are gentrifying. Do you think there was a sequence like that where it was original metropolises where people were kind of scattered around in tribal bands, and then there uh, was one reason or another to go collect in these uh, Native American megalopolises? No, it seems to me very much more likely, judging from what we know from skeletal remains, that we simply exhausted the capacity of those places to support human life. It's also very likely that when that happens, and I think it will happen again, we will declare those places to be cursed. Cursed? Now there's a way to protect land. <laughs> yeah, well, well if, you, if, you, if you think about places that we think of as cursed, the dark, and, the dark and bloody land of Kentucky is not a, 
a European expression. That's an Indian expression. It arises from what happened there before literature. It must have been very ugly. It was cursed. I sense a whole uh, nuclear waste proposal here. That, I mean, the, the best wildlife area in northern Europe now is around Chernobyl. So if the nuclear waste, instead of burying at these casks oh, in the Yucca Mountain, we just spread it around in areas yeah. that we would yeah. like to declare yeah. cursed, yeah. the animals will do fine. We'll stay out. Yeah. It's a great solution. Uh, related to that, I've got one more we, question. We are, as a nation, an ambulatory set of brownfields. Say it again. We are, as a nation, an ambulatory set of brownfields. We need to gather ourselves together and purge ourselves and get cleaned up. <laughs> so this is a biographical question for me. You were head of the Smithsonian Museum of American History, and then you were head of the National Park Service. Very different animal, just across the street, but still. For you, for the purview, for the constituency that you had, for the frame of reference that you had in North America, what was that shift like? Oh, well, John Jarvis, among others, is out there in the audience and knows more about that than I do because he watched it. Um, I did not, I was in, the, in, a, in, a, in an unheroic way in the Second World War, but I did not serve in the Marine Corps, so the Park Service was my first exposure to that kind of that kind of organizational ethos. The Smithsonian is a disparate collection of people like a university. It's not the same thing at all. Uh, the National Park Service at its very best is a collection of people who believe in their mission, are trained for it, are competent in it, and are rooted in particular places. Those are marvelous characteristics. Marvelous characteristics. They are not accessible in most faculties, except in a few tiny places. Um, and for me, it was inspiring to be buoyed up by a bunch of people who believed in their task and had considerable courage practicing it. We did not have an easy time, and we don't. And I remember you described uh, Park Service people as Marines for the environment. And, and uh, Francis, your wife, mentioned that it's basically a 19th century military institution yeah. because it was the military that ran it back then. Okay, a couple of kind of contemporary political questions that emerges from this 25,000 year time frame. We live in a society that says, uh, Vic Weiser, Vic Weiser, where are you? Right back there, not quite under the light. We live in a society that deals with complex public policy matters in simplistic, I win, you lose terms. How do we move in such a society to engage in a values-based dialogue? Well, it seems to me that, that once you are able to connect persons to fundamental principle that is benign, once you find in persons of any political uh, orthodoxy commitments to fundamental principles, you can draw forth from them sufficient tactical assent to parallel behavior. That isn't too complex a notion. You can draw forth from people of many persuasions, action, that um, will last long enough to get something done. Um, I don't think we can possibly be uh, presumed to agree on our rhetoric or on our habits of thought. We can agree upon fundamental principles. And I think there's a lot more agreement on that in this country than is being evoked by the dull, dry, secular dialogue offered us. A uh, question without a name. Would you please explain in more detail what effect you think 9-11 had oh, on I U.S. Just history? It, I, I just think it aborted the next cycle of reform. I think they got exactly what they were trying to get. 
and how does and it we play? responded precisely as any good terrorist would have wanted us to respond. And so it's now uh, several years later. How long does this effect go on, do you think? Well, we have to, we, we <laughs> it seems to me that we are just, we are, are, are um, in this marvelous moment of transparent longing on the part of a people that wants to believe in itself again. I, uh, it does not seem to me that this is a bitterly cynical me first nation in its aggregate. It's a nation that wants to be led toward decent purposes. And I just feel that it's time to go ahead and be candid in a passionate sense of commitment to each other and to the earth. It's as simple as that. Let's go. <laughs> I want my party back, I want my church back, and I want my country back. Your party back. <laughs> Roger, you used to be a Republican, and a good one. <laughs> what happened? And what would it take to get you back? Well, um, You ran for office. I mean, this was no mere, uh, you know, Sunday afternoon Republicanism. You were serious. Sure. Yes. I, the story unkindly re reminds me that, that that I got soundly licked by Gene McCarthy, but I did win the primary. And Hubert Humphrey did say to me that it was all my fault that he wasn't president because if I had licked Gene, he wouldn't have made it difficult for Hubert. So there you are. It's all my fault. Um, yeah, I, I served three times in the Eisenhower administration and a couple of times did things for Mr. Nixon and once for Bush won. Uh, I, I believe in governing and I believe in people who are serious about governing, not in keeping other people from governing. And that's what I think we've got now. Strikes me that's the important difference. This is the first time in American history, in my view, in which selfishness and bigotry have been conjoined in the governance of a single political party. We've had one or the other. <laughs> and that's not my party. That's, um, th this is a different thing. Uh, we can do some hand raising questions if you want. Somebody want to raise your hand and hold off, hold forth? You may roll that. Hey, hmm? Yeah, we're gathering. Oh, you got, he's got, why don't you sing it out? Paul Hawken has a question and he's right over there. I want to stand up, Paul, so you can. Yes, I think so. Um, well, first of all, we, we don't have much of an alternative. Um, there's a, there are, there are two, at least two, but there, I, it occurs to me that there are two traditions in American environmentalism. One is that of John Muir and the other is that of uh, Jonathan Edwards. They, they cross over in many ways. It, it is, I think, entirely possible to reach a, um, a determination to honor 
the earth and others. I think it's entirely possible to do that living in a monastery in a medieval city. I think that's possible. It was possible. It is possible. It's, I think it's harder. Most of us, when we consider in our own lives the moments in which we have had some transforming experience of relationship to the earth and the other, a sense of self-transcendence, that has occurred to us in the presence of a very limited number of people, if any, in nature. But that isn't true of all persons. And it's not true that there is just a rural or country or wilderness environmental consciousness and tradition. There is a gardening tradition as well. We, we're, we're, we tend to be a little exclusive in our, in our sense of what our relationship to the earth is and how much of it we require. In, in any event, like you, I, I very strongly feel that it would be a very good thing for the opportunity to be there for that kind of externally evoked moment of transcendence and participation. It's both transcendence and participation. But my own observation in the last four or five years is that the places in which there is the most vigorous, resonant, determined view of a necessity for reform in social and environmental causes is not in people who are at great distances from each other. It's among people who are very close to each other in community. So I'll take it anywhere I can get it, but I think we can get it in both places. Um, I'll take the hug I got from Dave Brower for being the first director of the National Park Service who thought wilderness was a religious necessity. It's the, it is, after all, a physical Sabbath. But it, um, I will also take the affirmation of the relationship of humans to each other that expresses itself both in nature and without nature. I'll take it either way I can get it. Both are necessary. Um, <clears throat> Puebloans tend to do it very well in an urban setting. That's all I want to this There are lots of people who don't do it my European way. They, there are people who do it among each other, with each other, and then into nature. It ain't just wilderness. Another hand-waving question right here. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful piece. Us Jungians hated it, but keep going. But I also think that there's a role for rhetoric, for the rediscovery of a passionate rhetoric, that, and that role is an absolute necessity. If, if, what we need to do is to recover the gut, to recover a rhetoric that speaks to the tummy and to the genitals and to the heart. That is a rhetoric that is a 
necessity. It, it is not possible for us to be led into sacrifice by an affirmation of selfishness. We're going to win on this because we have the argument for love. They don't. They don't. that is stopping me at this juncture is that, that both of those last two last questions, as a good Jungian, uh, I'm very conscious of having heard both of those questions before. So I'm stopping to honor them to the extent that I can. That is to say, I think those of us who have a sense that we have already heard an inquiry need to give it particular space and to be particularly slow in response so that it has a little chance to have its necessary breathing room. So I'm not going to give you a, a fast answer to this. Would you ask it again, so we give it a little space? Just say again what you've said before. Sure. Uh, this description that you have offered could have been offered in the 10th century at Cahokia, in the second century at Adena, just speaking of American places, been in these kinds of circumstances before. we uh, are offered a sequence of opportunities to, to respond to the world's condition as we find it. One of the, um, and <clears throat> one of the blessings of the human brain is that it is not, it is not a linear mechanism. It's a mechanism that that responds to necessity. That's what's called grace. So I guess the answer I would offer to you is that we can, if we are willing to admit it, make ourselves susceptible both to intellect and to grace. <laughs> 